Miriam, whenever you're ready. Okay, hi everyone. So Patrick pronounced my name very well. Uh, it's Marianne Chazelle Noel. I'm French, so uh, you have to get used to my accent. Uh, I work at the International Organization for Migration, which is the United Nations agency. And my perspective today will be on, on what the United Nations do and why it's, uh, it's a big global political issues. I mean, why climate migration is a big global political issues. And maybe um, we can discuss how can this be of relevance to you in your, in your daily practice. Uh, because what we hope, of course, is that what, we are, what the United Nations states discuss at the global level somehow will have an impact uh, in communities. Uh, I don't want to speak for too long, so I'll just try to, uh, I'm not going to speak um, on all of my slides. I just try to uh, uh, just do some highlights. And then at the end, I really hope that I can also hear from you because uh, from the presentations, you all seem to be uh, working in, uh, in jobs that um, are very relevant to the topic. And I'm just very curious to know what's happening outside of uh, UN global diplomacy. So uh, let me just start by um, um, by just um, telling you a little bit more about the International Organization for Migration. So um, it is a very big organization, but it's, it's not necessarily as famous as UNICEF would be, for instance. But regardless, it's a, it's a 70 years old organization. It's the largest UN agency that works on migration issues, and it's been about 25 years. Uh, that the organization is working on what we call environmental or climate migration. And why did we start to work on this? Uh, because as a UN agencies, uh, we are governed by our member states and they are interested in understanding better what climate migration means for them, not only at the, at the global level, but what it means for their domestic policies on climate change on the one hand, but also on migration. So the reason why we have been working more and more on the topic, it's because we've been asked to do so by um, some of our member states who have a stake in, in the issue. So here we're talking a lot about uh, small island uh, states, including some in the Caribbean, not too far from here, but also a lot of African uh, countries and Asian countries. So it's, it is really a, a very large global issue that countries from different parts of the world uh, have an interest in discussing and trying to put forward some, some solutions. Okay, so maybe just a quick note on who, as I want to call environmental or climate migrants. So for us, it's a very broad definition. Um, we're talking about people who, who uh, move either within their own countries or across the border. And we're also talking about the people who are forced to move, um, but also those who might choose to move. So this is an important distinction because a lot of the time when you hear that um, um, people migrating in the context of climate change, it's most, you, you mostly hear about people who are displaced by uh, storms or, um, um, or some kind of sudden um, event, but we, we, are, we are not necessarily thinking about people who might anticipate uh, degradation in the environment and that we might decide to move uh, before uh, there is a, some kind of disaster. Uh, and this is one of the most difficult things as well to talk about politically speaking because a lot of these migrants at the moment, they are uh, understood or seen as uh, economic migrants. Uh, there's been a, a few people have analyzed um, some of the migration, um, some of the migrants profile coming from the different Central and South American countries into the US. It's a big topic, I guess, for, for you guys right now. And uh, a lot of researchers have made direct link between their migration and uh, the drought conditions in their, in their countries. Uh, so this is for me a typical example where it seems that all of these people are economic migrants, that they are coming to the, to the US because they are looking for better conditions. Um, but in fact, if you're looking a little bit uh, behind the scenes, you realize that uh, environmental and climate change conditions play a role in, uh, in their decision to migrate. So we're also talking about the, this kind of people when we talk about climate migrants. And then finally, uh, for us, climate migrants, it's also people who might move uh, away from their uh, places of origin for uh, a long time, but also if, uh, for a short amount of time. So it's a very broad definition. 
um, at the global uh, level and in terms of the, of the legal dimensions of this, there is no accepted definition of who is a climate migrant, climate refugees, uh, environmental migrants, and so on. So you will, there's a lot of ways that uh, different uh, stakeholders will call people moving in the context of climate change and environmental degradation. So for the sake of this discussion, I'll just call them climate migrants, but uh, other people might call them something else. Um, and maybe just to add that usually because we, so my job is to work on global um, policy discussions. So usually the people we are speaking to would be diplomats or negotiators from um, countries from, uh, from different parts of the world who, um, who are negotiating um, either resolutions or um, agreements or who are negotiating in the context, in the context of the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So our usual audience uh, is more diplomats than technical people. Sometimes these negotiators also are technical people, but a lot of the time they are, um, they are not. So which means that uh, the discussions that we are having at the global level at the moment, we're focusing more on awareness raising. And I think we got there and I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. But uh, moving ahead, uh, we really need to go more into technical discussions. Anyway, um, maybe the, the other thing to mention who is a, a climate migrant is that from a policy perspective, we're also interested in what we call trapped populations, uh, which is basically the, um, the people who are not able to, uh, to move. Because we, by, <clears throat> when we work in the field, we realize that yes, some people are clearly moving because of climate change impacts or environmental degradation, uh, but a lot of people are also not able to migrate even though they would like to or they would need to. And this is another um, policy discussions that uh, is of importance to the countries at the United Nations. Anyway, so I think the main question that we are being asked all the time is how many environmental migrants are there uh, now and how many will there be in the future? I think the short response to this is that we don't know. And I don't think we'll be able to, uh, to actually ever uh, have a precise number. Uh, the main reason being that we don't have a definition of who is a climate or uh, environmental migrant. So therefore it's very hard to count how many people uh, are moving. But what we, the reason, one of the reasons why this became a big uh, issue is still, it's because um, some people have made an effort to come up with uh, some quantification of how many people are, are moving in the context of the, not just climate change, but um, generally speaking, environmental uh, impacts. And the, we realized that even if this data is not um, comprehensive, it it's reveals that still a lot of people are concerned. So that kind of acted as a trigger that this is an issue that is not just about a few people in, in some coastlines or in some small islands, but about a lot of people throughout the world. Um, so, I mean, I, I can share this presentation later on if you're interested in the detailed uh, uh, data, then you feel free to, to have a look. I think maybe here uh, on the question of data, the one thing to remember is that even though we do have some, uh, uh, an idea of how many people are displaced by a, by a disaster, um, so um, the, there are some people who can't, I mean, people are displaced by floods, storms, and even drought. And this comes up to about 70 million people last year. Uh, no one is really quantifying uh, how many people are moving because of the sea level rise or ocean acidification and so on. So there's a big gap in data, but I think there's a, an agreement uh, that we're talking here about uh, several dozens of millions of people. And looking at the future, uh, the World Bank did a, a very influential study last year that uh, estimated that there could be 140 million um, <clears throat> climate migrants uh, within their own uh, countries. So not even international, but people moving within their own countries. 140 million people uh, if uh, climate adaptation efforts are not uh, stepped up. So, from a political perspective, it's very scary. It seems like it's a lot of people. And of course, countries like the US or European countries are uh, worried that this would have an implication 
on their uh, um, migration flows towards, uh, towards that country. So what I would like to talk about here now is um, some of the discussions that are happening in the United Nations uh, Forum. Um, when I first started my job in 2013, uh, I started going to the climate change negotiations, um, the global climate change negotiations. So they take place every year under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCCC. So it's a bit of a barbarian acronym, but it is the main forum in which uh, the UN member states are negotiating uh, issues related to climate change. That's why we had the, the famous Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, so this thing is huge. I'm only following a tiny part of it, which is the, the part of the discussions that relate to climate change and migration. And I can see how big of a difference there is between now and 2013. Uh, a few years ago, most of the countries who were uh, negotiating in under this uh, UNFCCC um, were not thinking at all about migration of people. Uh, you are climate uh, change specialist, so you know way better than me uh, what these discussions uh, are about. Um, just as a disclaimer, at IWAM we work on the migration side of things, so we are not climate scientists uh, or environmental scientists, we are really migration policy specialists. Anyway, so for us, you have to imagine that we arrive uh, in these discussions on climate change, it's very technical, we don't understand anything about uh, what climate change adaptation means, but um, we are sensing that um, there is a political issue here that uh, will become bigger and bigger uh, because our, our member states are telling us that they are uh, either seeing um, in, on their own territory how, how the impact of climate change are pushing people to migrate or they are thinking about the future and they are uh, concerned about what the impacts will be if um, nothing changes. Uh, so in the Paris Agreement, uh, you have a tiny part of it which was very influential for us, uh, which is basically a, a moment, um, which is basically a paragraph that says that under the UN Convention on Climate Change, we should start looking at um, how uh, migration related to climate change impact should be dealt with by states who are party to this convention. Uh, the language we use is very uh, bureaucratic, so I'm going to uh, spare you this. But um, the bottom line here is that thanks to the Paris Agreement, the, a whole program of work uh, was developed um, under the, the uh, UN Convention on Climate Change. And um, that got a lot of countries discussing uh, what does climate migration mean to them, how they can address it in their... Uh, the different communications or national adaptation plans that they submit as a commitment to, uh, uh, to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so now it's been about four years that this discussion is happening. So uh, it, is a, it is a UN discussion. So you have to imagine that sometimes it's very slow, it's very bureaucratic, it's extremely political. Um, and, um, and generally speaking, it's not easy to understand if you're not inside uh, that world all the time. But I think what matters uh, to us is that we are seeing some kind of political, um, first of all, awareness, but also political will to um, handle the challenges linked to climate migration. Um, the main issue is that um, a lot, there is a little understanding on how this looks like in practice, uh, even though these countries have issued recommendations which are fairly general on how um, uh, looking at climate migration in their national context would look like. Uh, but at least from a political perspective, we are seeing interest in the topic, commitment through these political recommendations that something needs to be done. And what we're hoping is that this triggers down to the program and project level uh, for instance, under the, the Green Climate Fund, fund at the moment there are no projects which um, are about climate change and migration, but we are anticipating that in the near future uh, you, we, will, we will see some large climate change adaptation project under the UNFCC, under the, the Green Climate Fund, who will, that will um, uh, talk about climate migration and might be entirely dedicated to the topic. 
So that's the idea of engaging under the, uh, the climate change uh, discussions. So that's one part of the, of the UN world. Then we have a, a second part, which is a discussion amongst policymakers who are, um, who are working on global migration policy. So the same way that countries negotiate to reach some goals on climate change, uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation, they also negotiated to reach an agreement on, uh, on international migration. So unlike the, the discussions under the, the UN Climate Change uh, Convention, the discussions under the migration policy agenda are not binding. So that means that the, the text that they came out with uh, is a guiding text, but it's not, uh, they are, the countries are not forced to implement it. Uh, however, it was, still, um, it was still a big step forward. So what is this exactly? So there is, um, so over the, the space of two years, 2016, 2018, uh, the UN member states, most of them negotiated something called the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, which is essentially um, um, a text uh, that outlines a series of 23 principles that uh, UN member states should uh, align with when they are uh, developing programs and policies on international migration. Um, I have to say that the USA did not participate in these negotiations. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they did start, uh, they started negotiating and then they, uh, uh, they just stopped. Uh, so not all countries were part of these negotiations, but and it, at the end, about 160 countries uh, signed this, this uh, compact um, and committed to, uh, to basically try to respect the principles outlined in it. So in this text, you also have uh, uh, a whole paragraph that deals with environmental and climate migration and why this is important uh, uh, to us is because um, in terms of implementation of this agreement, we're looking at the next uh, few years uh, where there will be like a trust fund set up and uh, countries will volunteer to either finance project or implement them. Uh, and that means that again, there's a, a possibility for climate change and migration to, uh, to be um, uh, considered in practice in countries. So uh, we are trying to move away from the global discussions into uh, more concrete uh, policy and program at the national level, but also what we call at the regional level. So the regional level for us is uh, would be like a, a groups of countries which might have uh, some um, official um, uh, regional recognition. I mean, you have a lot of these regional agreements in, in, in different parts of Africa. I must say I'm, I'm not too uh, familiar with what's happening in Central and South America, but I know they do have some informal regional consultation processes where they're also discussing uh, the topic. So I think uh, to finish on, on, on these two uh, big discussions, um, the conclusion of that is that despite uh, a lot of, um, it was not a given at the beginning that a political discussion could take place on climate change and migration because it is scary uh, for countries at, at, on many different levels. It's scary because um, there is a, a tendency to think that if we talk about the topic, then it also means talking about uh, the legal rights and protection of climate migrants, which is a big uh, discussion which is, that is happening because at the moment there is no uh, 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 binding obligations of states to uh, protect people moving in the context of, of climate change. So there's this fear that if you start talking about this question, then it might create obligations on some countries to host uh, climate migrants or to provide them with uh, specific uh, protection measures. Uh, so that was, that was one of the, main, uh, of the main issue around that. But this political discussion actually did take place. The question of the status and protection of climate migrants is not solved. And of course, uh, I mean, in my view, it will never be solved. Uh, but there's still a political agreement that uh, beyond that, uh, there needs to be uh, um, something that needs to be done for uh, people migrating in the context of climate change. So I think we have overcome a lot of political resistance. Um, and this is mostly due to um, groups of countries which are very vocal on the, on the topic. Um, 
a lot of these countries are in uh, countries which are the most affected by the impacts of climate change. So a lot of, uh, of uh, island states in the Caribbean and the Pacific, and a lot of uh, sub-Saharan African um, states, as well as countries in Asia like Bangladesh or, um, yeah, mostly, it would be mostly Bangladesh, but you also have other countries like Vietnam who, who, are, who are interested in, in this topic. So I think um, what comes out of this discussion is, is an agreement that uh, if countries are going to look at, um, at this question, the, the, the priority is to focus on climate change adaptation uh, because basically what they want is to avoid people to be forced uh, to migrate. Uh, so it, it can seem a bit cynical um, because uh, everyone has an, <laughs> an interest in people not migrating, but I think it's also a genuine wish of the, of the populations that we're in contact with uh, on a daily basis when we do field programming that they, uh, they would rather stay where they are, but they feel that they have no choice. So, um, so a lot of this, uh, of this work will need to be done by uh, climate adaptation and mitigation professionals. Uh, and where we are trying to come in as the IOM is to try to uh, maybe focus attentions uh, on looking at cases where we know that there's a very high risk that people uh, will need to migrate uh, now or in the future if uh, uh, efforts are not, are not stepped up. But what is interesting as well in this conversation is that there is an acknowledgement that in some cases, uh, people will not be able to stay where they are. Uh, it will be just an, a physical impossibility. So then we need to start thinking about what, uh, what can be done for these people. Do we need like specific uh, new visas to be able to go to another country? Do they need some kind of, uh, of uh, protection status again so they can go to uh, uh, even uh, uh, another region within their own country or to a neighboring country to find uh, another place to live? So um, this was a very slow discussion, but I think we got to the point where there's an agreement that something needs to be done and that we might need to, uh, uh, to facilitate migration for people to go from one place to another. So I think it's, uh, what time is it now? It's uh, 3.40. So um, maybe just for me to add that uh, the more that this topic becomes uh, of interest, of political interest in, in, the, in the UN, the more uh, um, dimensions, uh, the more thematic dimensions, that's well, how we call it, uh, are also um, being developed. So now you have, uh, you have major uh, agencies, like for instance, the World Health, World Health Organization, they would be interested in health managing migration. Uh, UN Women would be interested in what the impacts of climate migrations are on, on, on women or gender in, in general. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach the, the topic. Um, and I think we are, we are moving in the direction where a lot of uh, different stakeholders, whether they are inside or outside the UN system, are working on climate change and migration, but from their specific perspective, whether it's health, labor, cultural heritage, the questions of indigenous communities, and so on. And, um, and maybe, so then maybe my last slide for now, and then we can maybe just uh, discuss. Um, as someone who works at the International Organization for Migration, so I work on global policy, but most of the people, the vast majority of people in my organization are um, creating, uh, developing and implementing pro projects in uh, all parts of the world. So we have 10,000 people who are spread across uh, something like 500 offices, uh, and their job is to uh, speak to their national government and to develop programs with them and to actually implement them. So the, the, the big issue here for us, and I think for the people who are interested in the topic at large is how does, uh, how do you actually develop more of these projects? How can they be helpful? How would you evaluate them so you know you are reaching, uh, you are targeting the, uh, the right people? How does it, I mean, essentially, how does it look like in practice uh, and what works or doesn't work? So how do you translate this policy, high level discussions, into uh, uh, concrete measures that could hopefully be uh, of support, not only to the governments, but also to the 
to, to the communities. And I think I will stop here and, uh, and give you back the, the floor. Well, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a, this is a great presentation. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions out here in our audience. Uh, so um, uh, let's start the discussion. Does anyone have any questions? And even beyond questions, if you have comments or if you even want to tell me in your daily life, uh, professional life, do you come into contact with this kind of issues? I'd be really interested to know. I think someone earlier said that uh, climate migration was something that they, they were working on uh, in, that, in their uh, everyday life. So I'd be also very interested beyond questions in, in what is your experience uh, as climate adaptation professional and whether you see that this is a topic that uh, is a concrete topic for you or is this just a kind of uh, intellectual interest? Patrick, this is Susie. Can I ask a question? Oh, of course. So first of all, thank you, Miriam. This is a, a great presentation, and I hope um, you'll share the presentation with us since you had to jump over some of it. I'd be very interested in it. Um, I guess, you know, I've, I, my comment falls into the category of the, that you opened up, um, the latter category of a comment and how this is relevant. Um, I don't know to what extent people observe this weekend um, with you know the shootings we had in El Paso and the manifesto mm -hmm. this guy uh, posted, um, it was very clearly linked uh, to climate change and environmental degradation. Um, and I think this is an incredible wake up call for um, all of us to make the link um, to very radical right wing um, agenda um, and the topic that you just presented for us and, and that will you know, it's been sort of of academic interest for many number, many years, but it hasn't sort of been really in our day-to-day um, -day lives in, in the same um, way here, but I think it increasingly is. I don't know if uh, some of you saw maybe the um, article in the New Yorker in April that also suggested how climate change is making the border crisis worse and all mm -hmm. that. So in, in many ways, this is something that is now front and center for us. And, and I actually feel like I personally feel somewhat unprepared for how to engage um, that type of political rhetoric and um, not just political rhetoric, but obviously very dangerous um, behavior. So I just, you know, I don't know what, you know, the group thinks about this, but I, I just wonder if there is really a concrete way in which we can, um, as put a position statement out um, on, you know, how we feel about um, migrants coming to this country um, and what we see as our responsibility as professionals and how to prepare for that and think about that. Um, I think few of us have been involved in the refugee crisis um, in, you know, in professional ways, maybe as volunteers, whatever, but I just would love to hear some reactions and comments from the group. Um, it, and not to distract from, from the amazing work that you just laid out, but it just made me think of what is the responsibility for a professional organization and an interest group like this um, to begin to, to address this. It's very important, I think. Patrick, this is Mark. I'd like to respond to Susie and also thank Miriam for a great presentation. I'm going to respond from the standpoint of someone whose job is to find ways to get people to tax themselves to pay for public improvements. And in this case, let's put it right into what Miriam was talking about, what Susie was talking about. How do you address getting people to tax themselves to do something proactive, okay? In this case, we're talking about climate change adaptation or mitigation. Well, you typically, one of the things that's very important is comparing the cost of doing something to the cost of doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And you look at the question on the table with migration and to be, sorry, I'm to be really crass and probably politically mm -hmm. correct, but 
The cost of doing nothing, as Miriam showed us, is estimated at 140 million human beings on the moon. Whoa. There's a cost. And we can argue from what Susie said and people have pointed out that we're seeing that cost on our southern border right now. That's a cost of climate migration. So the question on the table to be going back to getting voters to vote for tax increases and bond measures in California is the cost of doing nothing is showing up on our border in multiple ways. So what's the cost of doing something? Well, we have our president wants to build a wall. Well, how's that, and again, being crass and, and not being ethical and all that, saying, well, how's that cost compared to the cost of helping people, as I think one of the people in the chat line pointed out, helping them deal with the fact that, you know, coffee prices, everything is being disrupted in Central, Central America economically because of climate change. What's that cost? That, you know, that's a cost of doing something. How's that compared to the cost of doing nothing? So, and, and for the benefit of also not just what Susie said, but for Miriam, in my own experience down in the weeds, that's one of the best ways of getting people who don't want to do anything, who do not want to take action, who don't want to pay for doing something, to actually reconsider is pointing out to mm -hmm. them the cost of doing nothing. And whether that works, mm -hmm. whether you're dealing with a bond measure in California, or you're at the UN trying to figure out how to get people to pay for, to pay to avoid tens of millions of people becoming migrants. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's exactly when the country started realizing that there will be a huge cost uh, for them to do nothing. Because I don't think that they, I mean, I'm, some countries obviously do care about the morality of, of this discussion. But a lot of, uh, of, uh, of countries are just plain scared that this means that they'll have uh, a lot of people uh, crossing borders uh, and that this will be an, um, you know, like a, a too high cost to pay in terms of public opinion, uh, mostly. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes people have to be scared, policymakers have to be scared um, into, into action. Um, so yeah, I think the estimating the cost of doing nothing uh, sometimes is a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, <laughs> way of trying to achieve something. Uh, so this is Patrick. I just wanted to throw out something, and and I'll just make this. I'm going to read actually a comment in the chat box, but from um, Blasman Jimenez. Uh, Work on immigration and seeing how the price of coffee in Guatemala has dropped dramatically, and how mining companies are forcibly removing indigenous populations. Also, I am from Puerto Rico and seeing how recovery, quote unquote, means rezoning and forcible displacement for native population to make room for investors. I thought it was an a important comment. And the only thing I'll throw out is um, definitely Susie and Mark, your comments are very well noted. Um, I, I want part of me, well, again, I try to steer, steer clear of politics here, but I think it's kind of unavoidable in some cases. But I do wonder, I, I have a hunch that some of the children and grandchildren of the people who are very anti-immigration right mm -hmm. now might they're in, the, in their own futures will be looking to um do some migration of their own it'll be interesting to see how that works out but anyway that's my comment Miriam, this is Joyce Coffey, and um, I think these big questions that Susie has raised for us are really important. One thing that your um, presentation, though, also reminded me is that this is often a sovereign discussion about migration, including migration mm -hmm. within countries. And so I would just offer mm -hmm. something that's, I think, quite interesting in my observation about the U.S. federal government as it relates to sure. migration, that, um, you know, right now there is... Uh, the focus on retreat is only around buyouts. And so the things that we grapple with in the United States government, like through the Housing and Urban Development and FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, are, mm -hmm. relate to things like how much do we value a property that we're purchasing in order mm -hmm. to move people along and, mm -hmm. um, or support their move, sorry. <laughs> and then also how do we get them to quote unquote volunteer so that we mm -hmm. don't end up with like a checkerboard community um, and also no actual uh, knock-on benefit from the retreat from a coast, for instance, or from 
to retreat from a river's edge because the sponge function of the earth can't be returned as well when there's a checkerboard and because infrastructure still needs to be supported for community members that choose to stay. So I just wanted to point out this real dichotomy that I found so profound, especially in the um, graphics that your, your presentation showed, because we're talking about providing um, hundreds of thousands of dollars per household to help them to move from um, situations after a trauma. And uh, it seems quite different from the conversation, of course, that you're having um, with uh, folks who have so little and need so much, and yet they have such mm -hmm. extraordinary resilience. So just a mm -hmm. general comment about how it seems to be playing out here, over and above the migration question that um, you know, Susie, you tabled, or below uh, that, I guess. Mm -hmm. but it's very interesting you mentioned that, because one thing I actually did not mention, but which is very important, it's exactly what you just uh, talked about. So in our link, what we call this planned relocation uh, of, of people, I'm sure, it, it, can be called in, in different ways, but let's say that the, in the UN world, we tend to call this uh, planned uh, relocation. So um, there's been quite a few UN studies commissioned on that specific topic. They looked mostly at examples from, uh, uh, from Pacific Islands, but I, I think some discussions have taken place on what's going on inside the US. Of course, I mean, uh, in my daily job, mostly, we talk about developing countries because countries like the US, France, or European countries usually are able to handle their own, uh, their own issues. Um, so that's why most of the, of the time we're talking about developing countries, but that doesn't mean that the discussion is, that the, the issues are not uh, similar in, in welfare countries. Anyway, this question of relocation, I think it's one of the most profound uh, uh, questions that come that come up uh, on a daily basis because it's actually very real and very uh, concrete. And that what we realize from the examples that we do have uh, is that people are extremely reluctant to move, even if you offer them all sorts of incentives, because it's beyond the, the economic, uh, it's beyond economic dimensions and it's beyond just the fact that they're feeling that they might be in danger. They just don't want to leave uh, their place. And then, like, and then relocating people, even if it's just a few kilometers inland, um, just creates so many, 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 many uh, uh, legal and um, uh, uh, and logistical issues. That um, yeah, we just realize how complicated it is to do it in practice. It's just to talk about it seems it seems like a it's a, a process which can be managed relatively well. Uh, in practice, it's extremely uh, difficult. But I think maybe um, at the moment, this, this, this kind of relocation take place, takes place within countries. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the near future, we start talking about relocating people, uh, I mean, communities across border. And mm. let's stop here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, this is Rachel from ASAP. And you know, one aspect of the relocation issue that we talk about a lot within the ASAP staff team is receiving communities and preparing receiving communities to be you know, good hosts of migrants um, who are looking to integrate into a new community. And um, you know, one of the reasons for that is that the ASAP kind of our physical office location is located in Michigan. So, you know, in the Great Lakes region, which is relatively climate safe and is expected to receive an influx of climate environmental migrants in the coming decades. And so, yeah, I think it's an issue that I guess, as I said, like our staff, it comes up in our staff a lot. And um, I think some of the, the work that we have been thinking about um, connecting with our members and doing together um, focuses on receiving communities um, in large part because we believe it's an issue that's not getting a lot of attention. And, um, you know, Susie, the Thank you.